You have, been given, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. Amen. Well, this morning we start a brand new series. The series is called The Art of Neighboring. And neighboring is an art. Loving your neighbor, it might seem like the simplest of things. Um, it's very simple to grasp on paper. We say, oh, yeah, yeah, I should love my neighbor. And yet it's one of the hardest things to actually, actually live out. We take G one of Jesus' most straightforward, most common sense commands, and we often complicate it, right? We ignore it. Um, we make it a metaphor or some ideal, but we often don't actually follow it. This idea of loving our neighbor. So I want to begin today by starting this conversation about what it means to love our neighbor. And beginning with this statement that what if Jesus really meant what he said? What if Jesus, when he said love your neighbor, really meant for us to do that? What if when he preached all of these things, he really actually meant for us to do these things? I know that seems kind of a strange thing, but oftentimes we like to sort of um, spiritualize them, don't we? Or, or make them into these metaphors or goals. And so in Luke 10, I'm going to look at Luke 10. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So there, we have these experts in the law, and they're always trying to trick and trap Jesus and test him. And they said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, if you read the Old Testament, that's a really, really complicated question, right? And so they're thinking, they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus caught up in some things. And he answers this way. He says, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? How is it that you get eternal life? And so they're asking what the greatest commandment is. What's the most important thing? Uh, what's the bottom line? What of all the rules, all the commandments, the debates, the gray areas is the most important? And really nothing else matters as long as we get this correct. And so he answers, love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, soul, strength, mind. So just love God with all that you have. Love God. And love your neighbor as yourself. It's really one and, and all together, this commandment, right? It's not first love God, then love, love your neighbor. The greatest commandment is to love God and love neighbor. That's it. Nothing more. And it seems so simple to say it that way, doesn't it? We can just take the whole of Scripture, boil it down to that, and go, we got it. One sermon. And yet it's difficult. And so I'm going to ask this question before, as we dive into this. We, we often ask, what is sin and what is not sin? We've been doing this for centuries in the church, haven't we? Uh, because we want to make sure we're getting it right. Or we want to make sure we can often get right up to the line. Usually we ask that question because we want to see how far we can go before we've kind of gone over the line. Well, is this sin? No? Okay. Is this? Mm, might be. Okay. Are you sure? Right? So this is why we do that. Or we want to make sure that we've gotten people all categorized. Um, we've spent a lot of time in the church debating this, discussing it, writing books, theologizing, and worrying about what actions are sin and what are not. And so they asked Jesus, what's, this, what's the greatest commandment? What's the biggest sin? And I love that he takes all of the sins, all of the rules, all of the laws, all of this stuff, and he says, fooey on that. Let's not worry about that. Let's worry about this thing. And if you do this thing, that stuff will begin to work itself out, right? All the law and the prophets, everything that we should or should not do, everything that is a sin or is not a sin is connected to these two things. This is the litmus test. This is the filter. This is the strainer for everything. And it's to do what? Love God and love our neighbor. And oftentimes, the vast majority of the things that the church has regulated over the years, and I like to say regulated because they're not necessarily sins, they're just things they regulate, often these things probably aren't sins, right? Or they're just things that we sort of don't like. We're always forgetting to start with love of neighbor. Um, and we can make sure if we get these things straight that we don't have to love neighbor. We would rather police our neighbor than do what? Love them. It's much more fun to police our neighbor than to love them. And so we can't keep skirting the issue or complicating it or ignoring it. And we must admit that Jesus meant what he said when he said, love your neighbor and love God. Do these two things. And so the problem lies, though, and it's been like this for thousands of years, in our definition of neighbor. That's where it lies. You know that story of the Good Samaritan or the Good, is it Timmy or Tommy? And Spike, that's right, that which, 
think I think in that story Frank was Spike. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. I'm kidding. Frank was Timmy. Uh, the issue in that story is that, see, the Jewish people at the time, they got around this whole love God and love neighbor thing because they said, okay, God says to love our neighbors. Well, let's just redefine who is a neighbor and who is not. And if we can define you as not neighbor, then we don't have to love you. Voila. And so, for example, Samaritans were not considered neighbors, and therefore you did not have to love them. Simple, right? You see, if we have a narrow definition of neighbor, then I can narrowly apply this commandment. If I take and kind of reel it in and say, well, these are my neighbors. These are my neighbors, and therefore I can obey God's command, the greatest commandment, with, I mean, I can get this thing down pat because I'm loving them. And the problem is Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 no. Neighbor is big. Neighbor is wide. The entire Bible defines neighbor as every single person on earth, whether you like them or not, whether you understand them or not, whether you agree with them or not, or whether they, this one's hard, deserve it or not. Right? So what if we stopped labeling people by anything other than neighbor, or at least we start with the label of neighbor, and then go from there? So when you see someone you don't like or disagree with or are bothered by, and you say, that oh, neighbor, damn it. <laughs> And so we begin there. No one is outside that definition. We don't get a pass that allows us to pick and choose who we love and who we don't or who we consider neighbor or not. It's not as though God says, you have five neighbor cards. Play them well. <coughs> All right, you get one, you get one. So we've got to stop. It begins with our physical neighbors, right? It's easy as, we often use neighbors, the people that live on the left or right of us or across the street. Simple, or the people in the pews around us. The church for 2,000 years has had a real problem just loving the people within the building, <laughs> let alone the people outside the building. So it begins there. It begins, and then it moves with into the people you don't like. They're your neighbor. I'm going to list some people, and this might seem a little redundant, but I'm going to say a group of people, and I want you to just respond with neighbor. Okay? Kids. Neighbor. Love them. This is a little game we're going to play. Millennials. Neighbor. Love them. LGBTQIA people. Neighbor. Love them. Muslims. Neighbor. You should love them. Immigrants. Neighbor. Love them. Foreigners. Neighbor. Love them. Liberals. Neighbor. Love them. Conservatives. Love them. See where I'm going? Drug addicts. Neighbor. Love them. Refugees. Neighbor. Love them. Homeless. Neighbor. Love them. Mexicans. Neighbor. Love them. African Americans. Neighbor. Love them. People that support the team of the nether. Just kidding. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> They're still neighbors. They're still neighbors. That's what's crazy. Um, poor people. Neighbor. Love them. Rich people, Neighbor. love them. Older folks, Neighbor. gotta love them. Uneducated, Neighbor. gotta love them. Educated, Neighbor. gotta love them. You see where I'm going. We could keep listing them. We go on and on. They're all our neighbors, and we are commanded, not suggested, not hoped for, not as a goal, but commanded to love them. Anything short of that is sin. You want to know what sin and what isn't? There it is. And love of neighbor must be real and it must be tangible. We love saying, oh, I love that person. I love you. Do you? <laughs> my thoughts, I do. My thoughts and my prayers are with you. <laughs> I wrote on your big deal in all caps. Um, what I need when I'm struggling, what people need is real and actual love. Prayer is amazing, and we need to start with prayer. But our prayer should lead us to action. 
Let your prayer move you to real acts of love, real tangible things. They don't have to be big things. A lot of my friends have been down to my dad's house in Trona, and on Facebook they were all very concerned, especially when we couldn't get a hold of them. And, and I asked people to pray, and then what happens is they're ready to load up a truck and go start working. See, prayer is an action. And actually, in October we're going to do that, and we've already got building materials donated from a contractor to put roofs back on houses. And see, prayers, it's a great place to start. And then actions, and then keep praying, right? It's sort of like prayer wraps up all the actions. It must be real and tangible. You see, our love of neighbor must be real, but it's also a reflection of our love of God. If we can't love our neighbor, then we probably struggle with this piece. And I've talked about this before, but it starts there. Love is like a flowing movement within and through us. It starts with God. God is love, and God so loved the world that God gave all. God showed you and me that love while we were sinners, while we didn't deserve it, while we could not earn it. God became flesh, dwelt among us, died, and rose again for us. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. And yet God continues to extend that love on and on and on. There's an everlasting supply of it. There's never a place in this world where you are beyond God's love. If you miss everything else today, get that. Some of you just need to hear that. That you're never beyond God's love. There's never a moment ever in your life, no matter what you've done or will do, where God stops and goes, oh, I'm done. Right? We don't worship a God with a shaky finger. We worship a God with open, loving arms. And our response to that should be to love God back. To worship God. To fall on our face and say, God, take all that I am. And the crazy thing is, is that God gives us grace and strength to love God back. And then if we love God, because God loves us, then we should love what God loves. And if God loves the other people around us just like God loves us, then we should probably love them. But we don't do it out of some source of love in our own selves. We do it out of the love that God extends to and through us. Sometimes we just have to submit to that. Often I need to get myself out of the way. I'm often the obstacle. We often think that the reason that we can't love someone or certain groups of people is because, well, they act a certain way or they do certain things. And I would say that we're wrong there. The reason we can't love people is because we just don't want to. Or because this relationship here is struggling. We've redefined God and then we've redefined neighbor. And then we've got ourselves off the hook of loving people. God can give us the grace to extend grace. And then I want to wrap it up with this. Jesus, in this last verse, I love this, the last line. You have answered correctly. <laughs> this debate. Do this and you will live. Whoa. We, often, we don't put that on things. We don't remember that line. Do this and you will live. You will live. Remember Jesus said, I have come that you might have abundant life. If you want to really live life, here's the upside down truth of the gospel. You really want to live and enjoy and have this amazing, fulfilled life that is abundant. You do that by loving people. And one of the biggest things, reasons we don't love people is because of fear, don't we? If I extend myself to them, they might harm me. And so instead of loving, instead of living, we cut ourselves off. I think we've been lied to by the world. We've told that real life comes by protecting our life, by securing our life, by putting up barriers between us and others. When the truth is, real life comes when we take down barriers and extend ourselves. It's risky, isn't it? Loving people's dangerous. It really is. And yet it's a good thing. And so my challenge this week, not just this week, but all the time, is to ask yourself first, who is in your mind not a neighbor? Who on that list made you uncomfortable? All right, who, who on that list when we were shouting those out made you go, uh, bye, those people? Right? Maybe it was the two political things I mentioned. All right? You said liberal, and you went, yeah, right. And there is a conservative, but yeah, they're not. Or whatever. Maybe I didn't even list it, and you went, ooh, thank God he didn't list that. 
<laughs> then I have to shout out neighbor again. You see, this is where we need to start. Help me to see those people as neighbor and not my enemy or not less or not to be feared or other. They are my neighbor. Confess the sin of not loving them to God. And say, God, forgive me. God, help me to love them. God, I don't even like them. They drive me crazy. They do these things that I don't understand. Love them. Take a risk and, uh, and get to know them. Just get to know them. You might understand them, and you might love them. You see, there's often this struggle that we need to have God tear down. And then ask yourself, God, if I can't love them, if I don't see them as neighbor, what is it in me that's causing that? Where is this block and that flow, right, between loving you? God, help me to love you in a new way. And I love that we're doing this on Communion Sunday. Because this table is the ultimate expression of that, isn't it? This table is the ultimate expression of neighbor. This is a table that you and I do not deserve to sit at. And yet Jesus puts a seat for us, like a little name card. You ever been to a dinner or banquet with a little name card? It's kind of cool, isn't it? Unless the person at the name card next to you, you don't think is a good neighbor. <laughs> you see what happens at a table? You see why Jesus chose a table? You can't earn a seat at this table. There's not a ticket price to get at this table. The price has been paid by Jesus. <clears throat> because of Christ's love, you get to sit at this table. Because of the grace and mercy that's extended to you, you get to sit at this table. And because of that, every single person on earth, Jesus has set a place at this table. Some have never sat at it. Because we don't like our neighbor and we don't want to invite him to this table. And so I want to encourage you, God, who do I need to bring to this table? And as you come to this table in a few minutes, as you come to a table that Christ invited you to with love and grace, who is that group of people? Who is that person you don't want to have a neighbor with, be neighbors with? Who are those people? And picture them sitting next to you at this table. Picture yourself not only receiving the body and blood of Christ, but then turning to that person. And instead of cringing in fear and dislike, extending that to them. I picture Jesus as he did that that night, and he's going around the table, and he's like, here you go, John. Here you go, Matthew. Here you go, Peter. Peter. And yet he extends it. Here you go, Judas. Even Judas was neighbor. And so this table is for all of us today. It's not just for Methodists. It's not just for those who aren't Samaritans. It's for all of us. There's a place at it. In a few moments, I'll invite you to come forward. Uh, you will come and you'll take a piece of bread and you'll dip it in the cup. And you're welcome to kneel and pray. And as you do, I ask you to maybe lay a hand on one of these pillowcases and say a prayer a child that might receive one. If you don't want to kneel, maybe just touch a few as you make your way around and say a blessing over them. So I invite you to come in a moment. Again, if you've never been to this church, this table's for you. If you don't feel worthy, this table's for you. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he sat at that meal, at that table, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way that night, he took one of the cups of wine in that Passover meal. And he extended it to his disciples. And he said, this cup, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. For each of you, whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me bow with me. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come and you would be present in this table and at this table and that we would eat and drink of your love and grace. We ask that you would set this bread and this cup apart from its commonplace, that you would be present here, that we would be eating and drinking of your love and mercy. 
And that we wouldn't just be remembering, but we would be experiencing that grace again. And then as we do, God, show us, reveal to our minds who we consider not to be our neighbors. Forgive us for that. Might we repent of that. And then we extend that love out beyond this table. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. And I want to invite our communion stewards to come. You don't see some of them that are on my list. So if they're not, oh, there's Carol. Pray we come.